Morning. Welcome to Destiny Christian Church. How many of you are ready to get into the Word today? How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? How many of you are already expecting? God's already moved today. God's already been doing, doing some moves and doing breakthroughs and healings and praise God. And uh, we're going to get into the Word. We're starting a new series called PG, Parental Guidance. How many of you guys know that uh, the Bible is the ultimate parent's guide, right? The Bible is the ultimate guide to parenting. So we're, just gonna, we're starting or jumping into a new series called Parental Guidance. Open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And uh, listen, whether you're a parent right now or whether you plan to someday be a parent, um, whether you're a current plant parent or plan to be a parent, my hope is that this series will help you to become a better parent and to equip you to raise your kids in the ways of the Lord. Amen? Now, uh, how many parents do we have in the room today? By show of hands, how many parents do we have? And how many of you would say... Uh, you can go ahead and put your hands down. But let's, we're going to take a little survey. How many parents would, would, would say and agree that parenting can be difficult? No, okay, okay, yeah, oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. all right. Most, most of the parents, some of you guys have it way too easy, I guess, where like parenting is like, ah, it's not easy peasy, okay? Let me ask you this now. How many of you would say that being a Christian parent and trying to raise Christian kids in our current culture has, it, it is also very difficult. Go ahead and like, just lift up. If that's you, raise up both hands and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Just, just say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Parenting is very difficult today with all the things that kids are so easily exposed to, both culturally and digitally. We have three kids. We have Rylan and Braylon and Jackson, uh, my wonderful, amazing, incredible, awesome wife, homeschools our kids, and so they are admittedly and joyfully sheltered from the insane, woke ideologies that have infected the public education system. We are proud to say our kids are sheltered. Amen? <laughs> we homeschool our kids, and they are sheltered. They are sheltered by the, from, from, the, from the woke ideology that's in the public school system. They are uh, sheltered from the sexually explicit children's books uh, that are in uh, the schools today. They are sheltered from the sexually confused teachers that hate America. And uh, my daughter is sheltered from not having to worry about a boy walking into her bathroom, um, unless it's one of her brothers, you know, because she is homeschooled. So if she forgets to lock the door, you know, a brother might walk in. But uh, parenting has always been difficult because you kind of learn as you go, don't you? Like, you can read as many books as you want before you become a parent. Like, if you're expecting and you have a baby on the way, you can go ahead and read all the books. But nothing quite prepares you for parenting besides just jumping in and raising a kid, and you kind of learn as you go. After your first, you kind of know what to do for the other babies that follow, but even then, one baby is not like the other. Again, we've got three kids. They are not the same. All three of our kids are very different, right? They each have their own personality. They each have their own way of communicating. I would argue that perhaps it's more difficult to be a child or a teenager today than it was when we were kids and teenagers. I think in the, the culture today, in the world we live in today, it's difficult to be a child and a teenager. It's more difficult to parent today with the mental health issues that are impacting our children at an alarming rate. The mental health crisis that is impacting our teenagers at an alarming rate. At such a young age, at a ridiculously young age, we give our children uh, a cell phone. We give them one of these devices that is a supercomputer and at a ridiculously young age, parents are giving their kids these, these devices, and it's got everything. They've got, they've got access to everything that they never wanted to see. And we say, here you go, nine-year-old. <laughs> Take this and have fun. And essentially, what are we doing? We are giving our kids porn in their pocket, access to Everything, if you do give your children a cell phone, I would highly suggest and recommend you have parental controls on that device. But we are essentially uh, giving them this device that's got access to all the things that they never asked for and never wanted, or maybe on the flip side, 
everything they fantasized about seeing and we're giving it to them and we're hurling them into the world of TikTok and Snapchat and other social media where they can learn all about gender confusion and sexual perversion and ungodly influences. And let's be honest, sometimes as parents, we get it wrong. I know I've gotten it wrong. As a parent, I've made mistakes, I've messed up, I've gotten it wrong. We will make mistakes. We're not perfect, and parenting is no different. We will make mistakes as parents. We will have moments where we will look back and say, yeah, I think I got that wrong. Right? Have any of you ever been there? Any ever, would any of you, any parents ever look back and say, yeah, I think we, we could have done that differently. We could have done this. We should have done that. And so I want you to understand today, my goal is not to point out all the things you're doing wrong as a parent, but rather to show you just a few areas where parents can sometimes get it wrong. And so that is my intent today, um, because I want to prepare you to do things right. How many of you want to get it right? How many of you would say, I want to do my best to do parenting the right way, to do things the Lord's way, to do things the biblical way, amen? And so if you would open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse 4. We're going to begin in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, the Lord is our God. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Amen? There are many gods. There are, there's only one true God. There are many false gods. People serve the God of, of, of Facebook, the God of TV, the God of entertainment, the God of whatever it may be. There are many things that are vying for our worship. There are lots of things that are competing for our worship. But as Christians, as Christian parents, we say and we declare the Lord is our God. The Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving to you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. We got to repeat these things to our kids. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home. Talk about them when you're on the road. Talk about them when you're going to bed and talk about them when you are getting up. Talk about God. Talk about the Bible. Talk about Jesus. We got to train up our kids in the way they should go. Can I get an amen? amen? I want you to write this down. This is the first point that I want to give to you today or take a picture of it, and that is this. As a Christian parent, our primary purpose is to teach our children to love God. How many Christian parents do we have in the room today? Your primary purpose is not to send them to college. It's not to teach them how to just be a, a good human being. Your primary purpose as a Christian parent is to teach your children to love the Lord. That's your primary purpose. That's your calling. If we're going to teach our children to love God, I would suggest to you that we don't just be casual, cultural Christians. You know what a casual, cultural Christian is? A casual, cultural Christian is one who maybe goes to church on Christmas and on Easter, you know, the big Christian holidays. Well, we're gonna make sure as a cultural Christian family, we go to church on Christmas, we go to church on Easter, and on Thanksgiving, I'm gonna bless the meal. It's the one time a year I pray, it's at the Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and we might pray when we really need something, when we've done all that we could do, and our last resort, I can't do anything else. I, I guess that all there is left to do is to pray. That's when we might pray. And we might go to church on special events like when there's free Famous Dave's barbecue at the church, things like that, a special party. And so we call these people casual cultural Christians. But there's a difference, though, if you're Christ-centered. There's a difference between a casual cultural Christian and a Christ-centered Christian. 
a Christ-centered family, a Christ-centered parent. When you're Christ-centered, loving God with all your heart, when you're, loving, when you're Christ-centered and you're loving God with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, teaching your kids to love and obey God is your highest calling. When you're a Christ-centered parent, raising your kids to love and obey God is your highest calling. And it's incredibly important because as parents, especially in the early years of, your, uh, of raising your kids when they're at a young age, no one has greater influence on your kids in the early years than you do as the parent. I've always argued that as our kids get older and as they get around their friends and they get in school, um, their friends have a huge influence on them. And you, the level of influence you have as a parent begins to dwindle. But you have the greatest influence on your kids at a young age. You are their influence at that age, right? And so we want God's truth in our hearts. As parents, as adults, we want God's truth in our hearts, and then we want to repeat those spiritual truths to our children and pressing them onto their hearts. Amen? So how do we do that? Well, just like the text said, just like the scripture said this morning, we're going to talk about these things over breakfast. We're going to talk about these things when they go to, when they go to bed at night. We're going to, dry, we're going to talk about these things on the drive to school. We're going to talk about them at the dinner table. Amen? When we are Christ-centered as a family, when we are a Christ-centered family, God is not just a part of our lives. He's not just a piece of our lives. He's not just, he takes over, you know, this little section, this little compartment of our life. God is not just an add-on to our life. He's not just an optional feature or someone that we call on when we're in trouble. God is our life. God is our life. And that's the big difference between just being a casual cultural Christian and being a biblical Christian. And so when it comes to parenting, are we doing something wrong? When it comes to parenting, you might ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong as a parent? And so I'm just going to show you a few practical things today that I think we could be doing wrong. And so the first thing is this, what am I doing wrong as a parent? Number one, the first thing that I think we sometimes get wrong is risking too little. Risking too little. Let me explain. As parents, it's fair to say that we don't want our children to hurt, do we? I don't want my kids to hurt. I don't want my kids to be in pain. I don't desire for my kids to be uncomfortable. And so we want them to be safe. And so we're going to keep them as safe as possible. And so sometimes we go to the extreme to keep them as safe as possible. And we say, well, we're not going to let them leave the house. No leaving the house. But we're also not going to let them stay home alone. And they can't go to friends' houses. And they can't ride their bike, you know, uh, around the neighborhood. And they can't go for walks around the neighborhood because something could happen to them. And so we go to these extremes, where it's like, you can't do this, and you can't do that, you can't do anything, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. You know, when I was a kid, some of you are, are even older than I am. You remember this to be true. Uh, on Saturdays, you would wake up, you would have breakfast, and then your parents would kick you outside and say, don't come home till it's dark out. <laughs> Does anyone remember that? And I'm not, I'm not that much, like, I'm not old and this is how, like, my parents, I'm 37, and even my parents, like, this is what, this was Saturdays. Go outside. I don't want to see you again until after dinner. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe you can come home for dinner, right? But we'd be outside all day, and we'd be playing with our friends, and we're out, we're out in the neighborhood, and we don't have cell phones. My parents have no idea where I'm at, but they just hope and pray that I'm going to come home. <laughs> And what would you do when, you're, when you maybe come home for lunch, but if you don't come home for lunch, what are you doing? You're having lunch at a neighbor's house. You're having, no, you're having lunch at a friend's house. And when you were thirsty, what would you do as a kid to get a drink? The garden hose. That's it. Kids today don't even know what a garden hose is, right? And they, would, and they look at that thing and they think, you guys would drink water out of that thing? Rylan, have you ever drank out of a garden hose? Yes, all right. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm surprised. But hey, sometimes your kids surprise you. 
But the garden hose, the garden hose was the childhood community water fountain. Like, that was the drinking fountain. That was the drinking fountain. You just find the garden hose. And, 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 you know, the rules were simple. There were two rules. Don't die. And don't kill anybody. That was it. <laughs> And it's not that our parents didn't love us. It's not that our parents didn't care for us. But their top values were not risk avoidance. Their top values were not pain avoidance. Their top values were not comfort avoidance, right? Or, or I should say uncomfortable avoidance, discomfort avoidance. Some of you grew up in a time where your parents made you walk to school <laughs> by yourself, you walked to school by yourself. One mile. Do I have two miles? <laughs> Uphill both ways, right? <laughs> in, in 10 feet of snow or something. No jacket because you forgot your coat at home and you couldn't call your mom and dad to bring it to you. The challenge is this, and I want you to write this down. The second thing I want to tell you today is that in our effort to protect our kids from risk, we are robbing them from confidence. In our effort to protect them from risk, we have robbed them from confidence. See, not only have we robbed them from, being, from, from believing in themselves, but by taking away all risk, we've robbed them from the practice of putting their faith in God. We've robbed them from the practice of actually practicing their faith. Hebrews 11.6, I've shared this verse many times. It says that it is impossible to please God without faith. You cannot please God without faith. It is faith that pleases God. And so my, my question is, are we giving our kids opportunities to practice their faith? Are we as parents giving our kids, or dare I say, creating opportunities for our kids to practice their faith? Are we encouraging our kids to do the uncomfortable? Are we encouraging our kids to do things that take them out of their comfort zone so that they can trust God and put their faith into practice and, and, and trust God to give them strength? You see, we risk too little in an effort to protect our kids from discomfort. But if we'll encourage our kids to step out of their comfort zone and to practice their faith, they will develop confidence in themselves and confidence in their God. They'll develop confidence in God as we encourage them and maybe sometimes even force them out of their comfort zone and say, yeah, I know this is scary. Yeah, I know this is a little uncomfortable. Yeah, I know this is outside your comfort zone, but guess what? God's gonna give you strength. We're gonna pray about it. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna lead you in prayer right now. Let's pray. Let's go to God. And God's gonna give you peace. God's gonna give you strength. God's gonna give you comfort. And you are going to practice your faith. That's what a, that's what a God-honoring parent does. That's what a biblical parent does. Amen? That's what a Christ-centered parent does, is that we encourage and we create opportunities for our kids to practice their faith, put their faith in action, trust God. Amen? Number two. Number two, a second thing that I think sometimes we get it wrong is we are quick to rescue. We are, it's rescuing our kids too quickly. We want to step in and we want to rescue them too quickly. I know I've been guilty of this as a dad, especially any dads who have a daughter. <laughs> My daughter has me wrapped around her finger and there are things I will do for her that I will not do for my sons. <laughs> it's like, bud, you got this. <laughs> you can do it. Oh, my baby girl, you need help? Oh, daddy's got this. Daddy's got this. Let me just come in there and rescue you, right? Your child forgets to do her science project. Here's an example. Your child must forget, might forget to do their, their science project, and it's due tomorrow. And what happens? Mom stays up till 2 in the morning doing their child's science project. And then they celebrate when the child, you know, gets, gets an A plus or whatever. And awesome, good job. It's like, you did that. You as the parent did that. Like, your child didn't do anything. 
and you rescued them, right? Or maybe your child forgets to bring his jacket to school and he's cold and so dad leaves work and goes home and gets the jacket and brings him the jacket. You know what our dads would have done? Yeah, too bad. You won't forget again because you're cold and you're gonna walk home without your jacket and I bet you won't forget it again. See, rather than allowing our kids to reap the consequences of their actions, parents today oftentimes are quick to rescue them. We're too quick to rescue them. And I get it. There's, yes, there's grace. Yes, there's mercy. We want our kids, again, getting back to the first point, we don't want our kids to be uncomfortable. We want our kids to be comfortable. We want them to be safe. We want them to be warm. We want them to have that jacket so that they stay warm outside. But we gotta remember we got to remember that consequences make for a great teacher. You can write that down. Consequences make for a great teacher. If we rescue them from consequences, we're robbing them from great lessons. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oftentimes, if we rob our kids from learning if we rob them from experiencing the consequence to their choice, the consequence to their action, we are robbing them of a great lesson. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter six, verse seven. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You turn to your neighbor and tell him, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And when we, rob our, when we rob our children of God's natural consequences, it's no wonder that they don't fear God. It's no wonder our kids today have no fear, they have no healthy fear of God because we've robbed them of God's natural consequences to their choices. They made a choice. They were going to experience this consequence, but mom and dad were too quick to come in and rescue. Right? Sometimes, this is where we get it wrong, is we step in too quick and we rescue. We are too quick to sometimes rescue our kids from the consequences. And if, we, if you take away all the consequences, you rob your children of learning the biblical principle of reaping what they sow. You reap what you sow. Amen? Amen? We reap what we sow. When we make good choices and when we are obedient to God's word and we are obedient to his ways, we reap the benefits of those good choices. But when we're disobedient to God's word, when we're disobedient to God's ways, when we do things out of order, we reap the consequences of those bad choices. Our choices have consequences. Our actions have consequences. It's like the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole story to you, but you've probably heard this story. It's the story of the prodigal son. Jesus told this story, and there was a son who went to his dad and said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait until you die. I want my inheritance today. Will you give me what belongs to me now? And his dad probably regrettably, regrettably gave his son his inheritance. And what did the son do? He went out and he blew it and he spent it all. And he, he fell into sin and he, he partied hard and he, his life completely fell apart and he was totally broken. He had hit rock bottom eating with the pigs. And then he decides to go back home in hopes that his father would take him back as a servant. He realized as he was eating with the pigs because he was so broke, he was so so poor that there was nothing else for him to do but to go and work at a farm and eat what the pigs were eating. And it was in that moment that he decided, he realized, you know what, even the servants, even the slaves at my father's house eat better than this. He's like, let me go back home And let me ask my dad to just take me back in as a servant because even that will be better than this. And what did the loving father do? The loving and caring father welcomed his son back with all the love, 
all the grace, all the mercy that a parent could have. But I want you to understand something. His father did not rescue his son from the consequence of his choice. His son, or the father did not go chasing after the son to bring him more money. The father did not go chasing after the son to bring him some more clothes, to bring him some food. He did not rescue him. He waited for him to reap the consequences of his actions and to come home by his own choice. And so parents, don't be so quick to rescue your kids from the consequences of their choices. Allow your kids to learn the lessons that come with consequences. We need to know that we reap what we sow. And when we make poor choices, there's going to be consequences. Amen? Disobedience has a consequence. Our kids need to learn this. Disobedience has a consequence. Irresponsibility has a consequence. Forgetting to do your homework has a consequence. Staying up too late when you had to wake up for church the next morning has a consequence. Not preparing for the interview has a consequence. Remember that consequences make great teachers. Don't rob your kids from learning great lessons that come with consequences. Can I get an amen? So sometimes I think we get it wrong as parents by risking too little, by rescuing too quickly. And number three, I'm going to close with this point. Modeling too poorly. Modeling for our children too poorly what a Christian life looks like. Amen? Again, our key scripture for today, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's look at verse 5 through 7 again. It says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Love God with all your heart. Love God with all your soul. Love God with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I'm giving you today and repeat them again and again to your kids. Teach your kids to love God. This is your highest calling as a parent. As a Christian parent, your purpose is to teach your children to love the Lord, to love, Lord, to love God. I just want to say to the parents here, if we are not serious about our faith in Jesus, if we as the mom or the dad are not serious about our faith in Jesus, if we're not modeling a a sincere pursuit of living our lives for Jesus, how can we expect our children to do that? How can we expect our children to love the Lord when, when they don't see us modeling for them what it looks like to love the Lord? If the truth isn't in our heart, how can we impress that truth onto their hearts? If the truth of God's word isn't in our heart, how can we impress that truth on their heart? Because remember, when it comes to parenting, especially in the early years, more is caught than is taught. Your children, when it comes to your young, young kids, more is caught than is taught. They're watching what you do. Our young children are watching what we do. In fact, I would remind you that your children don't just become what you say. You can write this down today. Take a picture of this on the screens. Your children don't just become what you say. They become what they see. Your children will not just become what you say. Your children will not just become what you declare. You can declare all you want, what they're going to be. But if they don't see it, if they don't see it modeled for them, they're not going to become just what you say. They're going to become what they see. This is why it's so important that we model for them well. 
I say, we got to model for them well. As mom and dad, as parents, we've got to model for our children well. One of the fastest ways to drive our children away from God is honestly just to say one thing and do something else. The fastest way to drive your kids away from the faith, away from God, is to just live as a hypocrite. Allow your kids to see that you say this, but you do this. I see you play church on Sundays, but Monday through Saturday, I see you living this way. Church, that's the fastest way to bankrupt your children's faith. Let's not just play show and tell. Let's not just play church on Sundays, but let's model for them well, Monday through Sunday, what it looks like to love the Lord, what it looks like to serve the Lord. The moment that we proclaim faith in Jesus and we say we're a Christian family, we follow Jesus, but you don't pray, you don't read your Bible, you don't tithe, you don't forgive, you don't love people who are different from you, you don't serve in any capacity in your life, but it's just all about you all the time. We say one thing and we do something else and it's no wonder our kids abandon the faith. The fastest way to drive them away from Jesus is to be hypocritical. In fact, it was Jesus who said this in Mark, Mark 7, verse six, Jesus replied, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, you know how to say all the right things. You know how to show up for church on Sundays and do the amens, hallelujahs, thank you, Jesus. You know how to honor him with your lips, but Monday through Saturday, your heart is far from God. Now listen, we'll never be perfect. You're never gonna be a perfect parent. You're never gonna be a perfect Christian. That's not what this is about. But if we consistently claim one thing and consistently live something else, our children will see that. Our children will recognize that. And they will think, this is all just for show. This isn't real. My parents don't actually believe this because if they did, they would live what they believe to be true. Come on now. And so they abandon the faith because they never saw mom and dad actually practicing their faith. They only heard them claiming to be people of faith. And so church, parents, let's model well for our kids. Let's not model poorly. Let's not make the mistake of modeling poorly for our kids, but let's model well. Let's show our kids. Let's not just tell our kids. Let's not, let's not just say to our kids, church is important. Let's show them church is important. Let's not just tell them to love the Lord. Let's show them what it means to love the Lord. We're gonna spend time in God's word as a family. We're gonna take time as we do every dinner time. After dinner, we have family devotions. And it doesn't have to be super formal, your kids may not just sit in their chair real nice and quiet. <laughs> I've shown you the video before of what, what a day in the life of our family devotions look like. But the point is, you're practicing what you preach. You're showing them this is a priority. This is what we do. We open God's word and we're gonna read it and we're gonna teach it, amen? So let's model well our faith in Jesus. Can I get an amen? Let's show them what we believe. We want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. If you want to make that choice and have that assurance that you're saved and going to heaven, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be the perfect and final sacrifice for all my sins. Today I choose to live for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me righteous. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, we'd love to send you a free gift all about your choice to follow Jesus. Simply email us at the link below with your email address. 
It's time now to give in our tithes and offerings. We want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in your giving. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 that God provides seed to the sower. So keep sowing that seed and God will keep providing seed to sow. The best way to give is through our Church Center app. If you don't have the app, just pull out your phone, open up your camera, hold it over the QR code on the screen, and then click the link and that will bring you directly to the giving page. Thank you again for sowing those financial seeds. We pray that God bless and multiply your gifts in Jesus' name, amen.